War of the Wells by H. C. Wells, Chapter 14, in London. My younger brother was in London when the Martians fell at Woking. He was a medical student working for an intimate examination. He heard nothing of the arrival until Saturday morning. The morning papers on Saturday contained, in addition, the lengthy special articles on the planet Mars, on life and planets and so forth, a brief and vaguely worded telegram. All oh, the more striking for his brevity. The Martians, alarmed by the approach of the crowd, had killed a number of people with a quick firing gun. So the story ran. The telegram concluded with the words vulnerable, as it seemed to be. The Martians not moved from the pit into which they had fallen, indeed seemed incapable of doing so, probably this is due to relative strength, the Earth's gravitational energy. On that last text the leader writer is expanded very comfortably. Of course all the students in the Crammer's biology class to which my brother went that day were intensely interested, but they have no signs of any unusual excitement in the streets. The afternoon papers puffed scraps of news under big headlines. They had nothing to tell beyond the movements of troops about the common and the burning of the pine woods between Woking and Weybridge until eight. Then the St. James Gazette, in an extra special edition, announced the bare fact of the interruption of telegraphic communication. They thought to be due to the falling of the burning pine trees across the line. Nothing of the fighting was known. That night, the night, my, my drive to Levet and back, I rather felt no anxiety about us. He knew from the description of the papers at Cylinder was a good two miles from my house. He made up his mind to run down that night in order, he says, to see the things before they were killed. He dispatched a telegram, which never reached me, about four o'clock, and spent the evening at a music hall. In London, also on Saturday night, there was a thunderstorm above a reach Waterloo in a cab. On the platform from which the midnight train usually starts, he learned, after some waiting, that the accident prevented trains from reaching Woking that night. The nature of the accident he could not ascertain. Indeed, the railway authorities did not clearly know that at that time. There was very little excitement in the station, as officials failing to realise that anything further than a breakdown between Bayfleet and Woking Junction occurred. Were running the theatre trains, which usually passed through Woking, round by Virginia Water or Guildford. They were busy making the necessary arrangements to alter the route of the Southampton and Portsmouth Sunday League insertions. An eternal newspaper reporter mistakenly, my brother, for the traffic manager to whom he bears a slight resemblance, waylaid and tried to interview him. Few people, excepting the railway officials, connected the breakdown with the Martians. I read in another account of these events that on Sunday morning all London was electrified by news for Woking. As a matter of fact, there was nothing to justify their very stuttering phrase. Many, plenty of Londoners did not hear the margins to the panic of or Monday morning. Those who did not, who did take some time to realise all of the hasty worded telegrams in Sunday papers conveyed. The majority of people in London do not read Sunday papers. The habit of personal security, however, is deeply fixed in London's mind, and startling intelligence so much a matter of fact, calls in the papers they could read without any personal tremors. About seven o'clock last night, the Martians come out of the cylinders, moving about under an arm of metallic shields, were completely wrecked, broken station with adjacent houses, and massacred, mass, massacred an entire badoon, badoon, a cardigan regiment. No details are known. Maximans have been absolutely useless against their armour. The field guns have been disabled by them. Flying the stars have been galloping into Chisley. The Martians appear to be moving slowly towards Chisley. Windsor. Great anxiety prevails in West Surrey. The earthworks are being thrown up to check up the advance. Lumwood. Lumwood. L- Lumwood. Londonwood. That is, that is now the Sunday sun put it. That is how the Sunday sun put it. A clever and remarkable prompt handy book article. In a referee compared to the affair of the when when Minigree suddenly let loose in the village. No one in London knew possibly the nature of the armoured Martians. It's still a fixed idea that these monsters must be sluggish, crawling, creeping painfully, 
such expressions occurred in almost all earlier reports. None of the cryograms could have ri- been written by an eyewitness of their advance. The Sunday papers printed separate editions as further news came to hand. Some even default of it. There are was practically nothing more to tell people till late in the afternoon when the authorities gave the press agencies the news of their, in their possession. It stated that the people of Walton, Weybridge and all the district were pouring into the roads of Londonwood. Ward, and that was all. My brother went to church at a family hospital in the morning, still in ignorance of what had happened on the previous night. There he heard allusions made to the evasion and special prayer for peace. Coming out, he brought the referee. referee. He was also alarmed at the news that in this, I went again to Water News Station to find out if the communication was restored. Yama buses, carriages, cyclists, innumerable people walking in their best clothes seemed scarcely affected by the strange intelligence that news vendors were disseminating. People were interested, or if alarmed, alarmed only on account of the local residents. At the station, he heard for the first time the winds and jersey lines were now interrupted. Porters told him that there were several remarkable telegrams had been received in the morning by the Chesley stations, but these had abruptly ceased. My brother could very could get very little precise detail out of them. There's fighting going on about Raybridge was the extent of their information. The train service is now very much disorganised. Quite a number of people been expecting friends from places on the South Western Network were standing about the station. One grey-headed old gentleman came and abused the Southern Western Company bitterly to my brother. He wants shipping up, he said. One of the two trains came from Richmond, Putney and Kingston. Canadian people had gone out for days boating and found the lots closed and feeling of panic in the air. A man in blue and white blazer addressed my brother, full of strange tidings. These oaths of people's driving into Kingston and traps and carts and things and boxes, valuables and all that, he said. They come from Oxley, Weybridge and Morton. They say they have guns heard of tre- been guns heard at Chesley every fine that mounted soldiers told to get off at once because the marshals are coming. We heard guns fighting out of court station, but we ought we thought it was thunder. What the dickens does it all mean? The Martians can't get out of their pit, can they? Our brother could not tell him. Afterwards, we found, found a vague feeling of alarm spread to the clients of the Underground Railway. By the, way. the Sunday excursionists began to return from all over South Western, Lung, Barnes, Wimbledon, Richmond, Park, VQ, and so forth, and actually early, early hours. But not a soul and anything more vague, vague hearsay to tell of. Everyone connected with the terminus seemed ill-tempered. About five o'clock, the gathering crowd and station was immensely excited by the opening of the line of communication, which is almost inevitably closed between south-eastern and south-western stations. A passage of carriage trucks bearing huge guns and carriages crammed with soldiers. There were guns that were brought up from Woolwich and Chatham to cover Kingston. There was a number of strange repositories. You'll get eaten! We 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 the beast team as a so forth. A little while after that, a squad of police came into the station again to clear the public off the platforms. Rather went out into the street again. The church bells were ringing from even song. A squad of Salvation Army lasses came singing down to the road. A bridge, a number of loafers were watching, and curious brown scum that came drifting down the stream in patches. The sun was getting just setting. The clock tower and the houses of Parliament rose against one of the most peaceful skies it possible to imagine. A sky of gold barred with long transverse strips of reddish purple cloud. It was talk of floating body. One of the men there, a reservist, he said, was told my brother he'd seen the holograph flickering in the west. In the Washington Street, my brother met a couple of sturdy roughs who had been rushed out of Fleet Street with still wet newspapers and staring, star, star, starring placards. Dreadful catastrophe, they bought out the down, while other, once another down Wellington Street, fighting at Weybridge for description of false versions.
You're under in danger. He had to give threepence for a copy of that paper. Three pence. He had to give three pence for a copy of that paper. Then it was. Then only. He realised something of the full power of terror of those monsters. These monsters. He learned they were not merely a handful of small, sluggish creatures, but he their minds swaying vast metallic, body, metallic bodies. That day he could move swiftly in smite with such power that even the mightiest guns could not stand against them. They were described as vast, spider-like machines, nearly a hundred feet high, capable of speed of its express train, and able to shoot out a beam of ten seat, mass batteries, chiefly in field guns, been planted in the country about Hoshul Common, and especially between Woking District and London. Five of the machines have been moving towards the Thames, and one by hammer guns have been destroyed, in other cases, the shells have missed, and the batteries have been once annihilated by the heat rays. Heavy losses to all the soldiers were mentioned, but the tone of the patch was optimistic. The Martians had been repulsed. They were not invulnerable. They retreated to the triangle cylinders again, in the circle around Woking. Signalers had had, with helicopters were pushing forward upon them from all sides. Guns were in rapid transit from Windsor, Portsmouth. Aldershot, Woolwich, even for the north, among others, long wire guns of 95 tons from Woolwich. Altogether, 116 were in position, or being hastily placed, chiefly covering London. Never before in England had there been such a vast, a rapid concentration of military material. Any further senators that fell, its hope could be destroyed at once by high explosives, which were being rapidly manufactured and distributed. No doubt, Renner Poulter's situation was the strangest of gravest description, but the public was exalted to avoid discouraged panic. No doubt the march was a strange and terrible and extreme, but at the outside there were no more than twenty of them against one arm in it. The authorities had reason to suppose, by the size of cylinders, that on the outside there could be no more than five in each cylinder, fifteen altogether, or one at least was disposed of, perhaps more. The public would be fairly warned of the approach of danger, elaborate measures were being taken, protection of people in the threatened southwestern suburbs, and so they reiterated the assurances of safety in London, the ability of authorities to cope with the difficulty disposed by Quincy Prom- Provocation closed. This was printed in almost type on a paper so fresh it's still wet. There'd be no time to add a word or comment. It's curious, my brother said, to see how ruthlessly the huge contents of paper had been hacked and taken out to give this, pla- this place. All down Wellington Street, people could be sluttering at most pink sheets of reading. A strand was suddenly noisy with the voices of an army of hawkers following the pioneers. Men came scrambling out of buses to secure copies. Certainly, this was news sighted people intensely, whatever their previous apathy. The shutters of map shot in a strand, taken down by a said, a man in Sunday raiment, lemon, yellow gloves, even with visible, it was invisible. Inside the window, hastily fastening maps of Surrey to the glass. Coming on along the strand of Trafalgar Square, the paper in his hand, my brother came, so, my brother saw, saw the fugitive from West Surrey. There were men, there was a man with his wife and two boys, some articles of furniture and a cart, such as the greengrocers use. He was driving from the direction waves bridge to the bridge, and close behind him was a hay wagon, the five or six respectable looking people in it. And some boxes and bundles. The faces of people were haggard. Their entire appearances contrasted conspicuously with the Sabbath best appearance of the people on the London buses. People in fashionable clothing peeped out of cabs. They stopped the square and self sight which way to take and finally turned eastward along the strand. Some way behind came a man with their clothes riding one of those old fashioned tricycles. There was a small front wheel. He was dirty and white in his face. My brother turned towards Victoria and met a number of such people. He had a vague idea he might see something of me. He noticed an unusual member of the police relegating the traffic. Some of the refugees were exchanging words, exchanging news to the people on the number of us. One professing to have seen the marshes, borders and stilts, I tell you, joining among like men. 
Most of them were excited and animated by their strange experience. Beyond Victoria, the public house was doing a lively trade for the arrivals. On all street corners, groups of people were reading papers, talking excitedly, or staring at the unusual Sunday visitors. They seemed to increase as night drew on, until at last of those, my brother said, were well, like Epson High Street on Derby Day. My brother addressed several of these fidget figures, and got unsatisfactory answers from most. None of them could tell him any news of Woking except one man, who assured me him of Woking had been entirely destroyed in a previous night. Well, I came from Byfleet, he said. A man on bicycle came through a place in the early morning and ran for door to door and warned us, come away. Then there came soldiers. We went out and look. There were clouds of smoke to the south. Nothing but smoke. Out, not a soul coming that way. Then we heard the guns at Chensley. Pope's coming from Wabish. So I looked up my house and came on. At the time, there were strong feelings in the street that the authorities were to blame for the capacity to dispose of invaders about all this inconvenience. By eight o'clock, a noise of heavy firing was distinctly audible all over the south of London. I rather could not hear it from traffic in the main thoroughfares, but strikingly, through the quiet back streets of the river, he was able to distinguish it quite plainly. He walked from Westminster to his apartment near Regent's Park, about two, now very anxious on my account, and disturbed at the evident magnitude of the lecture or the trouble, his mind was inclined to run, even as mine had run, on Saturday on military details. He thought of all those silent with respect and guns, a suddenly pneumonic countryside. He tried to imagine boilers and stilts a hundred feet high. There were one or two cartloads of refugees passing along Oxford Street and several on the Melbourne Road, but so slowly was the news spreading that Regent Street in Portland Place was full of their usual Sunday night promenaders. I bet they talked in groups among the edge of Regent's Park. There was some, there was many silent couples walking out together under scattered gas lamps, as ever there had been. The night was warm and still, a little oppressive. The sound of guns continued immediately, and after midnight there seemed to be sheet lightning in the south. He read and reread the paper, fearing the worst that had happened to me. He was restless, and after supper, prowled out again aimlessly. He turned and tried in vain to divert his attention to his own examination notes. He went to bed, a little after night night, and was wakened with lurid dreams and small hours of mid Monday. The sound of dog knockers felt running in the street. Distant r- drumming, a clamour of bells, red reflections, darts on the ceiling. For the moment he lay astonished. Wondering whether day had come or the well gone mad, then he jumped out of bed and ran to the window. His room was an attic. He thrust his heap head out, up and down the street with a dozen echoes to the noise of his window sash. Heads in every kind of night of disarray appeared, and cries were, shout- were being shouted. They are coming, bawled the policeman, having the door. The Martians are coming and hurried to the next door. The sound of drumming and trumpeting came from the Elbury Street barracks. Every church in his shop was hard at working in the steep, with fervent, disorderly tongues in. There was a noise of doors opening, windows after window, and the houses opposite flashed with darkness to Lello in illumination. Up the street came galloping, a closed carriage bursting abruptly in noise at the corner, raising to the cluttering climax and the window and dying way slowly in the distance. Close to the rear on this came a couple of cabs, the forerunners and long procession of flying vehicles, going for the most part of Chalk Farm Station, where the northwestern special trains were loading up instead of coming down, the gradient in the eastern. For a long time my brother stared out of the window in a blank astonishment, watching the policeman hammering at the door of the door, and delivering him the incorrigible message. Then the door behind him opened. A man who lodged across the landing came in, dressed only in shirt, trousers, and slippers. His face is loose about his weight. His hair disordered from his pillow. What the devil is it? he asked. A fire? What the devil of a row? They sit both craned their heads out the window, straining to hear what the policeman was shouting. People coming out of the side streets and standing in groups in corners talking. What is the devil is about? said my brother's fellow lodger. My brother answered him vaguely, again the dress running his garment to the window in order to miss nothing of the glowing excitement. Presently men 
Selling unnatural the early newspapers came bawling into the street. London in danger, suffocation. The kings and, and Richmond defences forced. Fearful massacre in the Thames Valley. All about him, in the rooms below, the houses of each side and across the road, between the ter- park terraces and a hundred other streets of that part of Mel- Mel- Maryborough, of Westbourne Park District and St Pancras, Westwood and North- Northwood and Kingburn and at St John's Wood and Hampstead, Eastwood and Sodrich, Highbury and Hingerstone, Hang- Hoxton, and indeed through all the vast of London, from Erling to East Ham. People rubbing their eyes, opening their windows to stare out, ask aimless questions, dressing hastily. The first breath of the f- coming storm of fear blew for the streets. It was a dawn of giant panic. London, which had gone to bed on Saturday, Sunday morning, night, oblivious and alert, was awakened in small hours of Monday morning to a vivid sense of danger. And he walked from his window to learn what was happening. I rather went down into out to the streets, just as the sky between the puppets of the houses grew pink in the early dawn. A flying people foot, the vehicles drew grew more numerous every moment. Black smoke he heard people crying. Again, black smoke can occasion of such an anonymous an anonymous fear was inevitable. And my brother hesitated on the doorstep. He saw another news vendor approaching, I got the paper forthwith. A man was running away with the rest. A silly paper was shilling, such as he ran, a grotesque mingling of profit and panic. From this paper, my brother read, the crest traffic dispatch of the commander-in-chief. The margins are able to dispatch, discharge, and almost clouds of black and poisonous vapour by means of rockets. They have smothered our batteries, destroyed Kingston, Richmond, Kingston and Wimbledon. They are advancing slowly towards London. Destroying everything in the way. It's possible to stop them. There's no safety for the black smoke. But instant flight. This, that was all. But it was enough. The whole population of the great six million city was stirring. Slipping. Running. Presently it was, would be pouring a mass northward. Black smoke, the voices cried. Fire! The bells of the neighbouring church made a jingling tumult. A cart carelessly driven. Smashed amid street and curses against the water trough up the street. Sickly yellow lights went to and fro to the houses, and some of the passing cabs faulted in expectant distinguished lamps. Overhead, the dawn was growing brighter and clear, and steady and calm. He heard footsteps running to and fro in the rooms and up and downstairs behind him. He then nearly came to the door, Lucy wrapped in dressing gown and shawl. Her husband followed her ejaculating as my brother began to realise the import of all these things he turned hastily to his own room put all his available money some ten pounds altogether to his pockets and went out again into the street